Montana Ag Live is made possible by the Montana Department of Agriculture, MSU Extension, the MSU Ag Experiment Stations of the College of Agriculture, the Montana Wheat and Barley Committee, Cashman Nursery and Landscaping, the Northern Pulse Growers Association, and the Gallatin Gardeners Club. Good evening. You are tuned to Montana Ag Live, originating again tonight from the studios of KUSM on the very vibrant campus called Montana State University and coming to you over your Montana public television system. I'm Jack Reisman, retired professor of plant pathology. Happy to be your host again this evening. We've got a fun show this evening, a topic that we've never covered in the 20-some years we've done this show. So we're going to look at that tonight. You'll learn more about that here in a few moments. But before we get to that, let me introduce the esteemed panel that we have here this evening. On my far left, Yuta McKelvery. Yuta is a relatively new plant pathologist specializing in potatoes, but everything else too, sugar beets. If you have disease questions like that, go ahead and call them in tonight. There'll be a phone number on the screen shortly. And challenge her with some really tough questions. I like to do that. Yeah, yes, do. Our special guest tonight, <laughs> Shannon Arnold. Shannon is a professor in ag education. She has kind of a special project around the state. It's called agrotourism. And that's a very exciting topic because, honestly, people from back east, maybe the south, other areas of the country, actually will pay money to vacation on farms and ranches. And we're going to learn a lot more about that. And I may tell you a little story about that later on in the program. Tim Seipel, Tim, he's a weed ecologist. <laughs> and boy, that hurts me to say ecologist because he's really a weed scientist. When I first started in this business, everybody was a weed scientist. Nobody's a weed scientist anymore. Now they're weed ecologists. So whatever, Tim can <laughs> answer any questions concerning weeds this evening. Phone number is up on the screen. Keep that phone busy tonight because the more questions, the more you'll learn and the more exciting this program will be. Abby Saeed, Abby is our extension horticulturalist. She knows an awful lot about horticultural plants. So if you have problems with anything in your yard, garden, trees, so forth and so on, feel free to call those questions in and we'll get to them as soon as possible. Answering the phones tonight, John Hawley, and Beth Shirley, we thank them here. And remotely, Judge Bruce Lobo, who used to be the chief water court judge, will take remote questions. Shannon, tell us about agritourism. I'm fascinated by the topic. Yeah, so agritourism is growing in the state of Montana and actually um, across the United States. And essentially what people will say is, what is agritourism? And essentially it's just farms and ranches opening up their operations as travel destinations for visitors with specifically um, education or recreational type uh, purposes. And so it's becoming much more popular um, in Montana probably in the past 10 to 15 years. Um, there's more people visiting Montana. Um, COVID has really helped yep. um, as more tourists are becoming aware of the state and what the state has to offer. Um, and really there's interest in exploring more of those rural areas. So farmers and ranchers are taking this opportunity to not only educate the public about agriculture, but also to help um, diversify their operations and increase their income on their farms. Let me ask you a question. I'm fascinated by this, but say I'm an attorney in Omaha, Nebraska, and I want to get an ag experience. How do I go about finding somebody in Montana that I could vacation with and learn a little bit about agriculture? Yeah, definitely. So there's a lot of different resources that actually have been developed in the in the past really five to ten years. Um, there is a Montana agritourism website that I worked on a Department of Ag specialty crop block grant to create um, a few years ago. So that's a great place to find some resources. But if you really want to find different experiences, you can go to the Department of Commerce website and the Brand MT. They do a lot of marketing for different agritourism operations. Um, Abundant Montana 
right now is adding a specific tab on their website that is going to be focused on agritourism um, locations in the state. They currently already have lots of different tabs to find farmers markets, um, you picks, local foods, so lots of different opportunities there where you can search um, a portion of the state and see what opportunities exist in that part of the state. But we're pretty excited that they are now, within this summer, they're going to add a specific tab on their website for agritourism. Okay, it sounds fascinating to me, and I'm going to get back to you in a bit with a couple of email questions that came in. I want some examples of agritourism as we, as we go forward. But Yuda, a question for you. This came in via email last week, and it's from Fergus County, and that's up in the Lewistown area, for those who don't know Fergus County. Uh, his neighbor says they have wheat streak mosaic virus in their winter wheat, and that's a serious disease I do know. Any suggestions on if they do have it, what they could do about it? Yeah, so if it is in fact wheat streak mosaic, then right now I would caution them to uh, certainly not to spray the crop. Like that's probably something they're going to be thinking about. Um, but right now, if we killed the crop right now, we would kind of cause the the in, the mites that are transmitting the virus from one plant to another to leave that crop and spread into nearby crops or um, hosts in general. And so nearby crops that would be really vulnerable right now would be every spring sown small grain. And the earlier plant becomes affected, the more severe the impact will be on uh, yield. And so we won't avoid that, be a good neighbor. On the screen right now is a picture of a wheat streak sample that I received last year. And I just want to point out some characteristic symptoms. You can see that on the... <coughs> Leaves, they are yellow, but it's not a consistent or even yellowing. It's kind of in that streaking mosaic-like pattern. So if your crop looks anything like that, there's a good chance it's wheat streak mosaic. And other than that, just don't add any additional fertilizer because it'll um, encourage the mites to grow in population size and also make the plants more susceptible to the virus. So you just kind of want to... Hold it. Hold it, <laughs> yes. Okay. You know, that disease uh, back in the 90s caused tens of millions of dollars worth of damage here in the state. Mm -hmm. And growers have learned how to minimize mm -hmm. the problem, but they still run into it here and there. Uh, Tim, question from Bozeman. I like this one. <laughs> uh, have dandelions developed resistance to herbicides here in the Galton Valley? We seem to have more dandelions than any other plant. No, dandelions have not developed resistance to herbicides that I have that I know of, and we go through a really formal way of testing of testing that. Dandelions can be really hard to kill with herbicide, especially in the springtime when you might, when they're most conspicuous. Usually, managing dandelions is done better in the fall. Um, especially in forage crops like alfalfa, things like that. So people spray the pursuit herbicide in the fall in alfalfa. So in our lawns, they're really conspicuous. They're really here now, Roundup for lawns, those sorts of products. Maybe Abby knows a few more of the products and about how to manage dandelions in our lawn. But as far as we know, we have no resistance. They're just really hard to kill with herbicide. Yeah, one of the things I would caution about using, um, you know, glyphosate products in um, and around dandelions and, and any kind of herbicides in general, they're starting to show sublethal effects on pollinators that visit. Mm -hmm. yep. So if they've applied that product um, and a, a bee comes and, and feeds on that, um, that could have negative impact. So um, maybe removing those flower heads um, before you apply the herbicide, oh, if you are trying that strategy, mm -hmm. might be better. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> question for Haver. This person is interested. He says in agrotourism, or they say agrotourism. Is there an agrotourism association in the state? That's a good question. So currently there is not an established agritourism association in the state. Um, currently I'm working with a group of faculty here on campus um, on a Western SARE grant program and we are working to develop a cohort of producers that 
we are hoping to educate to help lead the development of an agritourism uh, state association. And so currently, we just have a Montana Agritourism Steering Committee, which consists of um, lots of different people across the state that work for food and ag development centers, the Department of Ag, the Department of Commerce, producers, um, different CVBs. Um, and so we meet once a month, uh, second Wednesday at 10 a.m. on a Zoom call. It's open to everybody. We talk about the issues um, within agritourism and some of the different challenges and opportunities. But again, this grant program that we're working on right now, one of our outcomes is that we will help to establish an association where somebody can then go and ask that group questions that they might have about agritourism. Okay, thank you. And I'm going to get to my question in a moment. Okay. We have one here from Conrad, uh, Abby. And this is an interesting question. This person has quaking aspens, and they're about 20 foot tall. Can they top it? And if they do, will it branch out and fill out more? That's a good question. That is a good question. <clears throat> when you do top um, trees, which usually we don't recommend doing in, in horticultural settings because it can really stress that tree out it, and it results in kind of a panicky growth and it will kind of have a lot of that bushy growth, um, which, which are usually more just vertical branches, which aren't as structurally sound, so they're more prone to breakage. So I wouldn't recommend topping the tree, but you could selectively prune and head certain branches back Back to their buds to kind of get it in the shape that you wanted to get it to fill out a little bit more but topping in general is not something that I would recommend I agree you know best thing of aspen is if you just control the weeds around the bottom or mulch them and you lose one there's always another one coming up yeah and there's kind of self-sustaining plants I love aspen trees they yeah. really do well yeah, here they are. Mm -hmm. um, okay Yuda uh, a question from Manhattan area, where we do grow a lot of potatoes. They are curious. Uh, they've had scad problems in their garden, so it's not a field. And they've heard that there are varieties that are more tolerant to scab. Do you know what those might be? I don't know off the top of my head. I'm still learning varieties. But if you're buying uh, uh, certified potatoes, which I recommend you do even for your garden, I'm sure you can ask the retailer about the traits. Okay, I do remember that the number one potato growing around the state in a lot of areas is Russet Burbank, and, mm -hmm. and that's pretty tolerant of mm -hmm. scab. And if I recall, uh, red varieties, Norland is one that's mm -hmm. somewhat tolerant. But other than that, um, I think get a hold of Yuda, and she can look up some of the other varieties, yes. and she'll learn which ones are more tolerant. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Big Fork, Montana, bush beans and pole beans, should they be soaked before direct planting? That's an interesting question. That is, um, and I that's a good question. I can't think of whether or not they should be soaked off the top of my head, but we do have a really nice Mont guide um, called Can I Grow That Here, which has a lot of information on vegetables in general, um, whether they should be direct planted, direct seeded, planted in transplants, when and, and the kind of processes. So I'd encourage you to look that up. And um, we also have a gardening workshop if you're interested in vegetables in general. Um, we have a gardening workshop that's gonna be taking place here in Bozeman, and that's gonna be a really nice way of uh, vegetable gardening is one of the topics and we have our veggie gardening expert Dr. Mac Burgess coming to to teach at that and he'll have a lot of great information on on just veggie gardening in general for that workshop so um, the sign up is open registration is open and, and the registration link will be up on the screen and um, there's also a phone number that you can call to sign up so definitely if you're interested please sign up okay my experience mm -hmm. with beans is you don't want to soak them because they germinate too fast and people have a tendency to rush putting beans on the ground <laughs> and we were talking about earlier and they're more prone to frost, frost damage. So they grow pretty fast just if you direct seed them. I did not soak the beans in water today <laughs> that I did seed. I, yep, they were dry. But I did water them in because it was hot mm -hmm. and it was pretty dry out it, it, mm -hmm. The top is pretty dry here in mm -hmm. the southwest part of the state. Yeah. Examples. I want to know some examples of agritourism because I have friends 
that I'd love to put into some agro-tourism type so they could learn something. Tell me some examples that exist here in Montana. Yeah, so there's a really nice framework out there that's this agro-tourism framework and it divides agro-tourism into five different categories. So the first being education. Um, some examples of education would be classes or farm tours on different farms. Um, it could be um, off-farm um, farm tours as well, or ag fairs. Um, the second being direct sales. So we have some u picks, we have some different farm stands on farms, and then we also have some farmers markets as well. Um, entertainment would be the third category, and that is some um, corn mazes, um, or hay rides or festivals on the farm, also including maybe weddings or concerts that you might hold on the farm. Outdoor recreation, a big one here in Montana, horseback riding, dude ranches, um, but then there's also hunting, fishing, hiking, um, a new area of astrotourism, and then hospitality. So these would be your farm to table dinners, your farm stays, um, and any maybe other outfitter services on the farm. So they kind of divided into these five categories and um, that's a good way to kind of think about different different um, buckets of agritourism. I have one question here and another one right here. Number one, how do you decide what to charge somebody for mm -hmm. agritourism? How is there any set formula? And that's a question that came in from Big Fork. Yeah, so that's a question right now. Um, as I mentioned, we have a grant. We have um, 14 different producers that are part of this uh, this grant program, and that was a question we just faced um, in our seminar last last two weeks ago, um, is how do we decide what we charge? And I don't know that there's a set structure for that. So some, some different ways that you can look at how to charge for these different services are asking some local people, um, asking some of the producers that are part of this agritourism program, um, seeing what your local community might charge for some of the different services that are offered. Um, there is a new tab on Airbnb that is for farms and experiences. And so that could be something that you can maybe just look at and see what other people are charging to go and learn how to make bread or, or whatever that particular experience might be. But really it's just seeing what the local community offers for some of those experiences and adjusting your prices um, accordingly. Okay. Sounds good. I have another one here. I'll come back to you in a moment. Uh, but meanwhile, um, Tim, this person wants to know, is there anything new in Russian thistle control and what herbicides are no longer effective on Russian thistle? Ooh, that's, a, that's a pretty good question. So Russian thistle is a late season weed. A lot of times what happens is you harvest your winter wheat and all of a sudden you kind of turn around and you look and there's a, a burst of Russian thistle in your fields afterwards. There is some Russian thistle. We do manage it in crop, in pulse crops. Russian thistle is resistant to some group two herbicides. Those what, what, are, what, what's group two? That's a herbicide. It's a large... so. Weed scientists, ah. <laughs> <laughs> weed scientists, um, we classify herbicides based on how they work, their mode of action, and then we call those group numbers. And so group two is one of the modes of action, and it stops plants from amino acid synthesis. And it's really actually pretty easy for a plant to evolve resistance to group two herbicides. So around the world, most, oh, many plants have revolved resistance. So Russian thistle has in Montana, along with um, wild oat, some cheatgrass, most of the kochia. And so it makes it a little bit harder to manage um, Russian thistle in crop in there. So you have to go in. Um, there's a few different products out there. We, what do we do with herbicides now? We mix them. We make very complex mix, mixes. So you have multiple ingredients, and those things will be called things like wide match, perfect match, wider match, koshivore, different herbicides. The price point goes up when you start mixing all those things together. So that's the short of managing Russian thistle. You have to be cognizant of group two resistance and then think about what you can do to avoid group two herbicides. How extensive is Russian thistle? It's pretty... Yep, Everywhere. whole state. Yeah, yep. okay. whole state. As we saw the last couple drought years too, 
that it really exploded in a lot of the failed crops, late season things. Um, we got a Russian thistles incredibly drought resistant. So the last couple of years in Montana with drought, we've seen a, a lot of Explosion. thistle. Yeah. Okay. Uh, from the Missoula area, Shannon, uh, they're concerned about the legal implications for someone offering agritourism. Uh, is there a liability involved? And you want to address that a little bit? So certainly there is. And I would um, encourage you that if you're interested in adding agritourism to your farm or ranch to visit with your local insurance agent. Um, it's a process um, of just talking with your insurance agent to explain what you're doing. Um, there was a House Bill 342 in 2017 that did establish um, some liability for, that participants assume liability for the inherent risks that are on agritourism association, or sorry, agritourism um, operations. Um, and there have been some recent bills that have been discussed in the legislature to help advance um, some of that protection. But right now, um, probably House Bill 342 is the best protection on that. And then visiting with your insurance agent to see um, if you can have a conversation about what that might look like for your particular operation. Okay, thank you. Uh Question from Ravalli County, Utah. This person has an alfalfa field that he figures is about 30% not living or not in very good condition. Any idea what might have caused that? Mm, well, like it's what It's a three-year-old like, stand. Yeah, if, so yeah. it's established. Well, what did it look like last year? If it was fine last year and now in the spring it's not greening up, it's, there is a chance it might be winter kill. And um, there are kind of two scenarios that could have happened, like maybe the plants didn't get hardened in the fall to prepare for winter, and then when the temperatures dropped, it killed the crown. Or if there were temperature fluctuations, they might have come out of dormancy in the spring and then were kind of caught off guard when temperatures stopped again. Uh, it's, un it's unfortunate in that they will probably not recover. Yeah. And so, um, yep, yeah, that's... You know, That's the interesting right. thing, last year we had an extended fall, yeah. essentially statewide. And when the snow came in early November, it fell on unfrozen ground. Mm -hmm. And a lot of plants really did not go dormant. Mm -hmm. I actually harvested carrots the following spring that I had missed last fall mm -hmm. that were in perfect condition because the ground never froze. Mm -hmm. I think that probably would play a role in whether or not alfalfa mm -hmm. survived. And excessive mm -hmm. moisture in the fall yep. also makes a difference. Um, Abby from Helena, they live in town. They have a large amount of old lilacs. And the last two years, they haven't been doing that well. They had them pruned, and you might want to say when you prune them, but it does not seem to have helped. What can they do? Yeah, so in terms of when to prune um, lilacs, it's a good idea to prune them after they are done flowering. So right now, all the lilacs around um, uh, Livingston, where I live, are, are flowering, and it, and it looks and smells beautiful. But wait until after those blooms, because you don't want to prune out the buds, so you won't have that... Um, flowery kind of show. So depending on kind of how old your lilacs are and, and kind of how um, close they're spaced, um, pruning, you can prune them pretty extensively too um, and, and cut them back pretty significantly and, and they'll fill out a little bit more. But one thing I might recommend is to reach out to your extension agent um, because there are multiple pruning strategies for lilacs. You can do a three-year rotation pruning or you can do like a, a pretty heavy pruning in one year. So um, if you've tried one of those strategies and they didn't work very well, you can try the other strategy. What about fertilizing lilacs? Yeah, I mean, uh, you don't want to over-fertilize, but if the soil nutrients are, are kind of depleted, that could be why they're they're not performing very well. But if you over-fertilize, you're not going to get those blooms. You're going to get that green growth instead of those flowers. Okay, thank you. Uh, Shannon, a call from Billings. Uh, they would like to know how the Montana Dude Ranch Association ties into agritourism. 
It certainly is a category of agritourism, and so dude ranches kind of fit in that outdoor recreation category of agritourism. Um, we have visited with the Montana Dude Ranch Association and have um, some connections within, the, within between the Agritourism Association and um, the Montana Dude Ranches, but they're certainly a part of agritourism that, that um, we want to develop better relationships with. Okay. Um. This is interesting. Now, I'm not sure. If, you know, this is, you and I can talk about this one. This is a Belgrade caller who says, while living in California, they used to collect morel mushrooms and rinse them in a bucket of water. Then they poured the rinse water under apple trees, and morel mushrooms would then grow under the apple trees. Is this unusual, or would this work in Montana? And I would say it's very unusual. I've never heard of it. <laughs> no, me neither. I mean, I, I guess the, my idea would be that they get the spores, and but I've the, never heard of that. People and, have tried for eons to try to culture yeah. morels <laughs> yeah. and have not been very successful. So I think this might have been accidental. If this really huh. worked, I think people would know about oh it. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So, <laughs> but anyway, interesting call. We do take that. comments and questions like that. It's kind of fun. If you do have comments, folks, yeah, we'll air them. I mean, we would like to hear from you. Mm -hmm. uh, Tim, um, what's the status, and everybody's worried about amaranth, and this is from Sydney. What's the status of that particular nasty weed right now? Yeah, so it's an interesting weed. It's one of these that weeds that's evolved a ton of resistance to herbicides in the United States. And Montana is one of the last few states where this plant hasn't established in our cropping systems, in our uh, forage crops and that sort of thing. So we've been keeping really close eye out for it. And as we come into this season, we need to think about it. If you have a lot of pigweeds in your field, if you're bringing millet in to the state, um, in North Dakota, used equipment, Millet seed and sunflower screenings have been the biggest vectors into North Dakota. Recently, someone found on a website called iNaturalist. So iNaturalist is a website where you can post photos of your plants to be identified by the public. And they posted a photo of a Palmer amaranth plant in Shelby, Montana. And it came from <laughs> someone's contaminated bird seed. So yeah. bird seed is actually contaminated with a whole lot of weed seeds. So always, you know, you can find a, some good weeds under your bird feeder. And so this plant came out of a bird feed. And it was a single lone male plant that grew in Shelby. And someone put it on iNaturalist. And then someone brought it to our attention. So that is actually the first record of Palmer amaranth in Montana. We definitely have to keep our eyes out for it. It's resistant to just about every herbicide we can name out there. And so we were really making sure we have early detection and rapid response. But in this case, the vector was bird seed, not millet seed, not used equipment out of the Midwest. But there was probably millet seed in the bird seed. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so Tim, do you have any recommendations or advice for kind of preventing or managing those weeds from your bird seed? Then? Yeah, I think, you know, I was just actually looking at under our bird feeder at home. We, I have some volunteer canola that's coming up. Um, we have some other weed seeds. I would just say, you know, keep an eye on that spot. We actually get into the Scudder Diagnostic Lab at MSU quite often. Weird giant weeds that grow under people's bird feeders. And so I think just keep an eye on it. And um, if you see weeds you don't necessarily know or are new, um, call your local county agent and get them to help you identify it. Okay, thank you. Uh, I am concerned about Palmer am Amaranth. Yep. And it, I hate to admit it, but eventually it's going to get here. Yep. And it is a tough one to control. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting comment from a person in Glendive. They say that they've had the same couple from Boston come out for one week a year to help on their farm. And they enjoy it every year. And these people hate to charge them for coming. So mm -hmm. that's what agro-tourism can do for you. I uh, think that's one of the challenges is a lot of 
farmers and ranchers aren't used to charging for sure. these types of services, but there is an audience out there that's willing to pay for it. So just kind of changing that mindset of, yes, people are willing to pay to um, participate in some of these different activities that they offer on the farm that are just part of their daily life. I had a friend from um, Cranberry, New Jersey, that visited me when I was doing my doctorate program at Nebraska. And we had an associated friend that lived in Cumberland, Iowa, who was a typical Iowa farmer, hogs, corn, soybeans. And because of this hobby association, Jerry from New Jersey drove over to see him. And it's about a two hour drive to Cumberland, Iowa. He was gonna stay for one day. He got so involved with the operations of that farm, he spent almost a week there. And to this day, 50 years later, he says that that's one of the most inspiring things that he ever did. So it is, it is a good business to be in. Um, from Big Timber, uh, Abby, what is the best mulch for garden pass over landscape cloth? They would really like your personal recommendation. Okay, so <clears throat> for garden paths, I would say as long as you don't have any established plantings within those, um, I don't recommend landscape cloth um, within any established plantings. Um, but if you don't have any established plantings, you can have a few kind of considerations in terms of whether wind is an issue. So where I live, wind is a big issue. So I'll probably use some gravel or, or rock as a mulch in between plantings. Um, like on pathways and stuff. Um, but uh, if that wasn't an issue, um, I also um, aesthetically like wood chips. Um, I think they look nice, but if you have a really windy area, you're gonna blow those wood chips all around the neighborhood. And Livingston is a bit breezy. <laughs> Pretty breezy. <laughs> you can put the wood chips down in Livingston and they'll land in big timber. <laughs> yeah. That's about right. Uh, but it's a beautiful city, I will say that. Mm -hmm. uh, while we're on the uh, mulch things uh, from Bozeman. Can you use gr grass clippings raked up from vole damage as mulch for small evergreens? They must have had a herd of voles <laughs> if they're <laughs> have grass yeah. clippings. Um, yeah, you can use grass clippings as mulch, but again, um, it, they're, they're nice to kind of add nutrients and stuff. They won't stick around. They're, they're going to decompose pretty quickly. Um, but yeah, you can um, if you want to, uh, um, as long as just, um, just make sure that um, if you are thinking about using grass clippings after you treat with herbicide, wait until a few mowings before you do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Shannon, from Missoula, they're curious, from what part of the country do most ag tourism participants come from? Is there any data on that? There was a recent national study that was done, um, but I'm not sure that there's data specifically about where they're coming from. I think more of the data was focused on more urban audiences visiting rural areas. And so it also differs between the parts of the United States and who's going to those different areas. Um, but there is a resource um, on the Montana Agritourism website where you can look up that particular study that might have more specific statistics and data that they can look at. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Abby, a question from Bozeman here. They have tiny little flying bugs whenever they water their house plants. What are they? How do you get rid of them? Yeah, I get this question a lot. And, um, you know, for houseplants in general, um, this is a pretty common issue because we tend to love our houseplants to death. Um, and so a lot of times those little flying insects when you water are fungus gnats and they're feeding on, on just the, the, fungal, uh, the fungus that grows within the soil and usually is a result of overwatering. And so as you just scale back the watering, let, let, the, let the soil dry out a little bit, um, and that should resolve the issue um, pretty easily. But yeah, we do tend to love our house plants to death. <laughs> and that's why most people don't do very well with them. <laughs> and on that note, here's a great little book, How Not to Kill Your House Plants. And I'm not promoting anybody's writing or so forth and so on. But this has got a lot of good information in it. You can probably get it on Amazon. You can probably get it here at one of your local nurseries or some wherever you purchase your books. It is really good. And if you're in the house plants, 
and I know Tim is, but he's not very good at it. <laughs> they die pretty rapidly. If you ignore them, a lot of times they'll do better than if you take really good care of them. So you might consider that book. Uh, Tim, I'm picking on you. Uh, from Forsyth, the caller has burr buttercup weeds. Do you oh, know what yep. they are? Mm -hmm. How does the caller get rid of these weeds without killing or harming the yard and surrounding areas? Whew. That's a tough question. So burr buttercup, it's a, um, if you go out and look, it's usually one of the very first things that will flower in the state. Um, it's a really small little buttercup and it'll get about this tall and you'll see it in disturbed areas around sort of well heads, edges of driveways, things like that. Um, I'm not sure that there's anything you could do to manage it really you could probably put a herbicide early on it in the spring, maybe before other things were dormant. I think digging it out or scraping it out with a hoe, that would be pretty tough work. Um, it is a very early plant. It will be gone in two or three weeks and you won't see it till next spring again and it'll be the first thing that grows. That's the easiest way to get rid of it. Okay. It'll be out of sight, out of mind in a week or two. Um, I think early, very early in the spring. It's kind of like bulbous bluegrass. That and bulbous bluegrass are the first two weeds we manage every year. And probably glyphosate over the top, I guess, would be the easiest solution. Um, be hard maybe not to damage some of your grass if it had broke dormancy. Okay. Back to the bluegrass, bulbous bluegrass. I am aware that I have a fair amount in the pasture around my house. Mm -hmm. What's the odds of that moving into a relatively well-maintained bluegrass lawn or yeah I, that's pretty small i think if you have a good stand of perennial rhizominous grass in there by by that i mean you know might be a mix of perennial rye might be a mix of uh kentucky bluegrass might have some other things in general that bulbous bluegrass won't move in i think it's in it's usually grows in dry spots um, where you have little vegetation cover, and it's the first thing that grows in the spring. Um, it's just now starting to shoot up and go to head around the valley. And if you keep it mowed down, it's also one that'll disappear and turn brown actually pretty quick. It's a really early season grass. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Yuda from Blaine County. Uh, they planted some certified spring wheat in late April. It's up and growing nicely, but he notices that there are gaps in the stand. Any idea what might be going on? Whew. There could be all sorts of reasons. I guess one question would be is does it seem like a regular pattern that like follows the rows or kind of associates with other uh, um, at features of the field or is it maybe more random you know that could kind of tell us is this maybe something that's related to a disease or maybe it has more of a uh, environmental cause maybe it's varying seeding depth like if they dug in and looked for what what the seed looks like in the ground is it germinating it just hasn't broken through the soil surface yet or is the seed not germinating at all that could tell us if it's maybe a seedling rot or maybe just variation in planting depth could be all sorts of factors. I think I'd need to know a little bit more about it. it yeah, I mean, you can definitely dig a few of the plants and see, but cutworms or wireworms could also mm -hmm. be involved with that if it's in a roll mm -hmm. effect. Probably cutworms more than anything else. One question would be that they use a seed treatment. True. Um, if they didn't, then there is a chance that all sorts of things got after the seed. It's all hard right. to tell, yeah. They get a hold of you to, to with, the extension office and have them have a look at it. And if they don't know, they're of course welcome to reach out or send a sample to the Scatter Lab. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got a question about harvesting for, and this comes from Conrad. This is interesting. This person would love to join an agritourism. He'd actually pay for people to come out from the cities and drive trucks during the harvest. <laughs> now. We have a labor shortage in agriculture. Can any of that be partially alleviated with agritourism at peak periods of times? I think absolutely. Again, I think it goes back to 
we are accustomed, those that are farming and ranching, we're accustomed to some of these different things that we do on a daily basis that people will pay for um, so that they can have that experience, whether it's driving a grain truck or, you know, experiencing something with your animals. And so I think that's certainly an experience that they could promote and offer as an agritourism type of experience, especially if you can even you know, offer some lodging for them, um, some different meals. different types of meals, different experiences. Um, so again, I would say having them talk with their insurance agent and find out what, what that might look like for their operation. You know, I'm talking about feeding them and so forth. I neglected to say that I accused Jerry, the guy who went to Cumberland, uh, Cumberland Iowa, to do that, I accused him of only staying there because of the gooseberry custard pie that this person's <laughs> wife made, and it was absolutely delicious. <laughs> he denied that, of course. Uh, this is probably not really uh, for this panel, but I'll throw it out there. Any knowledge about flathead boral beetle causing the woodpeckers to feed? The larvae is killing the trees. You know, you want to jump on that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, and it depends on kind of what they're asking about that. Um, there are a lot of um, flat-headed borer larvae that affect a lot of our different landscape trees, and, and usually woodpecker damage is indicative of having a borer um, inside the wood there. Um, so in terms of kind of treatment, it would depend on the type of tree that you have. So I would reach out to your local extension agent, but um, certain uh, insecticides that are systemic insecticides, like soil drenches, those work pretty well to kill those insects again depending on what it is so reach out to your local extension office and see if you can get an ID on on that insect and that should uh, help uh, um, get to the bottom of how you can manage those okay so finally we're going to get to this we talked about it ahead of time and the question came in from Gallatin Gateway and they say we are inundated by dandelions in our three acres lawn. What do you do? It's not only them. This Gallatin County has more dandelions per square meter other than Canada thistle. It is probably the most prevalent weed around. Do you need to control it? How do you control it? Is it good for anything? Is it bad for anything? Talk about the dandelions we have. Dandelions. You can you can eat some. Marlise, if you're at home watching me on TV, we had some in our salad for dinner the other day. Um, so, you, you know, I think the view of dandelions of whether it's good or bad depends on who's looking at it. In a forage view, you know, it, it's probably not a bad forage if you're grazing it there. Where it becomes problematic in alfalfa and a lot of our things is it's a very damp plant that holds a lot of water. You press it in a bale, it makes a lot of moldy alfalfa, a lot of moldy bales. Then you may lose protein when you'd rather have alfalfa or other forage in there too. In your lawn, um, I think it's in a matter of opinion whether we, we want to get rid of it or not, and we could, pro we could debate that a lot. Um, you can use a number of different herbicides that are sold at the hardware store that have um, herbicides that will affect dandelions. Will they kill dandelions? Dandelions are hard to kill. We already talked about that. You know, if you dig them up, you see how they have these huge roots on them that go very deep and they have a big root crown. You know, that herbicide doesn't always kill that big root crown on there. So that's the one thing you have to think about. Fall is the better time to spray your dandelions in your, your lawn. I realize now they're most conspicuous, but fall is the better time to manage them. I don't know, Abby, what do you think about yeah. for pollinators and different things like that? Yeah, so um, for pollinators, um, what, what kind of research has shown is that dandelions aren't the best source of nectar and pollen. It's not a very nutritious nectar and pollen mm -hmm. for bees. And so they aren't the best source of food. Better sources of food are other early season flowering plants, so planting those. Um, but pollinators will use dandelions if there's nothing else available. That's why you'll see in areas where you don't have mm -hmm. many 
other flowering plants. You'll see um, bees and other pollinators on your dandelions. But one of the things that comes to mind in dandelions and lawns is a lot of times dandelions are growing in um, areas where your turf isn't um, competing with them very well. So um, making sure that your turf is healthy, um, aerating your your um, you know, turf and overseeding with the desired turf grass species is a good way to kind of fill in those gaps. Um, seeing if you have compacted soils and um, make sure that, that you're taking care of the grass. You can increase the mowing height of the grass a little bit um, and that encourages that root system to go a little bit deeper, which means your, your turf will be more um, resilient to kind of incoming weeds. So kind of a, a, a multi-pronged approach where you're taking good care of your turf so it can mm -hmm. kind of compete with these other weeds. So I'm going to throw in a little bit here and pick on Don Mathry, who sits in this chair for quite a few years. And Don has stopped using herbicides and started to dig his dandelions. And I actually drove by his yard yesterday. And to be honest, he's not been very successful at digging the dandelions. <laughs> it is a tough. Harry Miller also <laughs> likes to talk about how he goes home sometimes and he does dandelion yoga, bending over <laughs> repeatedly with a hori hori knife digging out the dandelions. But it is, you won't win that. Well, you won't win, but you might get more flexible. Okay, I'm just <laughs> joking about that, Don. Anyway, uh, Shannon from Custer, how would you advertise agritourism opportunities? I think if you if your operation wanted to um, advertise agritourism, then I would say to reach out to the Abundant Montana um, folks. And again, they are they have an entire list of farms and local types of operations where you can advertise the different activities that you can offer on your farm. I would also say to reach out to your local um, extension agent reach out to your local food and ag development center representative um, so they can also help. Um, your, you can also visit with the Department of Commerce and again the Brand MT program and has local and regional representatives that can help you through some of that advertising and marketing of your operation as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, from Gallon County, uh, this person would like to know why the winter was so hard on pine trees. You know, you can jump on that or... Um, well, I think the winter was hard on a lot of trees with pine trees. I mean, are we talking about a forest setting or pine, are we talking pine about... Pine trees, probably. Yeah. Well, I, I guess same as with like backyard trees, like it was a dry year once again. So the plants were not, you know, very well equipped to prepare for the winter and so like we have in our garden settings winter kill when the plants are not watered properly it's probably a similar issue i would suspect with the pine trees and forest just lack of water and a really long winter <laughs> you know on that note somewhere here we have a question from east of brady montana and they say they've been in extended drought for three plus years they're finally getting some rain which is good news mm. a friend near the marias river says it's still very dry are we still actually in a drought in the Golden Triangle? My answer would probably be yes, Tim. Yeah, what? it's like D1, D2 drought status. If you go to the Climate Prediction Center, the drought there's a drought monitor, monitor that you yeah. can see the map. Um, I think it is like D1, D2 strata, um, status. So better than it was last year, but we're not out of the woods. And, you know, it's gotten really hot really fast oh. this year and, and dry. So, you know, a former colleague in the department would talk about flash droughts and how they tend to develop and things like that. So it's not just, you know, these longer term droughts we think about. Sometimes they develop really quickly, too. Yeah. Uh, and boy, you notice it here. Mm -hmm. It's 80 degrees and yep. the lawns are showing stress. Already. Yeah, my, my yeah. peas were stressed today looking at them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is a good question for Abby. Is it better to do broccoli transplant or direct seed them? Yeah, that's a that is a good question. So <clears throat> I've found that my broccoli does better from direct seeding. I feel like it produces even quicker than if you're if you're putting in transplants. Um, so I've had a lot of success with with um, just direct seeding e being even better than than transplanting broccoli. But again, these these kinds of veggie questions that that uh, gardening workshop that we have um, those uh, these kinds of topics will be covered in that workshop. And so um, if you are interested in broccoli and any other kind of our, our plant that we grow in Montana. 
I think Perry Miller would disagree with you. You think you think <laughs> transplants for he would say? Well, Perry tried for three years to direct seed, mm. and he lives out here in the Gallatin Valley, and he gave up. And I said, okay. "You're doing it wrong. Try transplants." And yeah. now he. And now in, he has success. He has more broccoli. He knows what to do. Very with. okay. Well, <laughs> yeah. I, I guess it depends on on yeah what you're doing. Uh, the other issue with uh, direct seeding, you have. Uh, Flea beetle damage. That's true. If you're if for your younger seedlings, they can kind of take them out. So you'd need to protect them better. I'd use a row cover or something like that when you're when you're seeding your broccoli, so that um, you're protecting them from those pests. Okay, uh, Shannon from Norris. First call we've had from Norris in quite some time. Uh, they would like to know: Are ranchers more successful in attracting agro-tourists than quote traditional farming operations? Mm -hmm. Tough question. Uh, yeah, um, I think it all depends on the type of agritourism experience that you can offer. Again, we talked about a lot of different types of um, experiences. So really just thinking about what, what does that farmer ranch currently have as far as infrastructure, resources that they could maybe utilize um, to attract visitors. And sometimes it might just be um, that visitors might just want to camp on the land or maybe they want to, um, you know, go out into the land and, and look at the stars. Um, so thinking about what are the different types of agritourism that you could potentially offer um, on your land based on what you currently have. Um, there's lots of different opportunities out there, I think, um, to, to think about what are your current assets and what can they provide for that tourist. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, from Helena, a caller brought some wildfire seed that was packaged in Wisconsin. And that's always dangerous to do that. I'll make that little comment. And there is white cockle showing up. How should it be controlled, and is it present in other areas of Montana? Um, I think I, I know what they mean by white cockle. It's this, um, yes, I mean. Butter? Yeah. yeah, it's a big, big headed on it. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I think when you, we have to be really careful with wildflower mixes, and maybe a Abby could add a little bit to that. It may say wildflower mix. It doesn't mean it's native to Montana. doesn't mean it'll grow well. could definitely contain weeds in it. Um, how to manage the white cockle? Um, maybe if you want to save all the other flowers that are in there, then I would go in and selectively dig it out. I have a, I call it a hori hori knife. It's a... Uh, stainless steel Japanese it's a knife about this long and it cuts perfectly and I just selectively pop things out that's what I'd do in a garden bed I think yeah and, and in terms of yeah you nailed it with the with the wildflower seeds I I would say if you are interested in getting wildflower seed mixes to um, reach out to kind of local suppliers and local mm -hmm. nurseries that have regionally hardy varieties and and know exactly what is in that mix um, so you're not introducing any weeds or even invasive mm -hmm. uh, invasive or noxious weeds. Okay, thank you. Yuda from uh, Kalispell. They have carrots, uh, some of which in pastures have turned kind of red and the tops get kind of wild growth on it. Any idea what that might be? Carrots and pastures, wild carrots? Uh, carrots in a garden, yeah. No, um, I don't know. <laughs> um, I think that might be Aster Yellows, which is a leaf hopper transmitter. Right, yes. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure. A sample Would if it happens. kind of early this time of year? Well, this is in past years. Oh, That's happened. So they're oh, okay. a little bit curious. Mm -hmm. uh, from Missoula. And this is an interesting comment. They wanted to pass along the name of a product for controlling dandelions. Mm -hmm. It's called Iron-X from Gardens Alive. He said it would be cost prohibitive for a field, but has iron, and dandelions are sensitive to iron and doesn't kill other broadleaves. I've not heard of it. And I yeah, there's a, in Bozeman, there's a number of horticultural um, lawn care people that provide that as a service. I have never evaluated it in a trial. Yeah. Okay. Um, Abby, asparagus, how long can they cut it? Um... In terms of like length or, or until when? Well, no. Uh, I think they say how long after it germinates, how many 
Mm. Cuttings can you get off of that? Yeah, part? usually I would say depending on, on it, you know how how um, established your your planting is, I usually get three to four um, cuttings of mine. Um, but uh, I would keep an eye on it and make sure you don't over overdo it. So what do you usually get? I usually try to limit it to about four weeks cutting. Yeah, yeah. And if they're real spindly, I let them go. Exactly. You don't cut if they're so. Spindly. But if good thick ones, I think yeah. in established beds you can go four, maybe even five weeks. Yeah, exactly. But if it's not a four or five year old bed, you probably don't. Yeah. Want to be cutting that much. Mm -hmm. uh, Tim from Townsend, uh, best wild oat herbicide to be using right now. They have a significant problem with wild oats. Um, depend on what crop it is maybe, um, and it depends on how resistant that wild oat is. Um, there's some wild oat in the state that's really resistant. Around Townsend, I don't know much about herbicide resistant wild oats. If you're talking in spring wheat, probably Axial XL is the go-to these days. It's a group one grassy herbicide. Um, in pulse crops, there's not. You can use many of the grassy herbicides, clethodim, axial, those sorts of things like that. In wheat, you could also try using things like Everest or Express herbicides. Um, in spring wheat, barley, there's less options. Um, but if I didn't cover their crop, tell them to call me on Monday morning, and we can go yeah. over it. Everest still work pretty good. Yeah. Um. Yep. In the Mondac, it does work on wild oat fairly well. Yep. Okay. We're down on time. Uh, one quick question for Abby: the Yellow leaves on the lower parts of tomatoes. Anything to worry about right now? No. It's a nutrient deficiency. They want to be in the ground as soon as you can. Check your forecast and put those in the ground and and um, bury them deep for your tomatoes. And I'm planning mine this week. I'm Perfect. taking a gamble. I usually wait another month. <laughs> but, nope, they're going in. Uh, thank the panel tonight. Yuta, Shannon, thank you for coming in. Interesting, Tim, Abby, thank you again. We'll be back not next week. Next week we're taking a week off. It's Memorial Day weekend. Hopefully it normally snows that weekend. Maybe not this year. <laughs> Two weeks we have uh, Hayes Guzzi on forages. We'll see you then. Stay well. Good night. For more information and resources, visit montanapbs.org slash ag live. Montana Ag Live is made possible by the Montana Department of Agriculture, MSU Extension, the MSU Ag Experiment Stations of the College of Agriculture, the Montana Wheat and Barley Committee, Cashman Nursery and Landscaping, the Northern Pulse Growers Association, and the Gallatin Gardeners Club.